Busy baseball insiders coming up. We've got the World Series matchup. Bert's got inside info on the Dodgers, and we've got a little bit of history. The Baseball Insiders starts right now. Welcome to the Baseball Insiders podcast with Mark Carmen and Robert Murray. Bert, I uh, we got to start here because I actually can't believe that we're in this moment in time. The Atlanta Braves did not have a winning record until August the damn sixth, but here they are in the World Series, knocking off uh, the Dodgers now 106 wins, knocking off the Brewers, 88 win Atlanta. Let's go. Can they take down what is, I think we got to say, an all-time great team in the Houston Astros at this point. I mean, it's been impressive. I kind of buried the lead there a little bit on my respect for the Astros, which has grown to gargantuan proportions. Good to see you, my friend. How the hell did Atlanta do this? Hey, good to see you too, first of all. Um, That is a tremendous question, and it starts with Alex Anthopoulos and what he did at the trade deadline. He entered it without... Uh, Ronald Acuna Jr., who was out for the season with an ACL injury. Mike Mike Soroka, their ace, was out for the year with an Achilles injury again. Um, And Marcelo Zuna um, was was out for the remainder of the season as well. And yet he ended up buying at the deadline when many people and many executives who would have been in his shoes would have probably ended up selling. It started with Jock Peterson, and he ended up continuing with Adam Duvall, Eddie Rosario, Jorge Soler. Um, and it's resulted in the Braves not only remaking their outfield, but also like just becoming a contender. They were Anthopolis. I asked him about this, like why he ended up doing it. Um, and his response simply was that they were not far off in the division. They had a winning roster. They have really good players, Austin Riley, uh, Freddie Freeman, to name a couple. Um, and he was in a position where he wanted to be, aggressive and not give up a lot of people in their farm system. And um, those, the, the talent that he added at the deadline combined with the talent on the roster got him to this point today. If the Braves win the world series, it will be because of Freddie Freeman. This is where your stars come to play. Um, And we ended up seeing it in this last series too, where Freeman was really good, but you win with your stars in these kind of games. And I think it's going to be Freeman, or if there's another candidate, I'll go with Austin Riley. I was thinking you were going to say their bullpen. Is you that- know, Tyler Matzik, that guy is an absolute animal, man. Like he, he pitches every game and yet he's lights out. Like his story is remarkable. He, uh, he's got tremendous angry face. Oh, he I mean, does. I, I think if you're a reliever, you got to have it, right? You got to have the, the, the stare down. And when he was going multiple innings uh, the other night, I forget what game that was. I think it was game six. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when they were wondering, is, is he going to come back out? He's going to, does he have enough? And he's just sitting out there like, I'm going I'm to I'm kill you. Yeah. I like, you know, I, I, that, that's a, that's a big part of it. What, what do you like about his story? Give a little background. Yeah. He was an underdog guy. He ended up, he was basically not in baseball as of a couple of years ago. Um, he was, he had the yips. He was like, he was about ready to give up and he ended up going to a, a, a skills coach um, and ended up reworking his mindset and really got, to believe in himself again. And he ended up coming out on a whim, signing with the Atlanta Braves under the recommendation of a scout. And basically the reaction from the front office when the scout recommended Matzik was like, huh, like why would you be interested in him? But they ended up signing him. Um, And obviously I, like, I feel like people exaggerate this kind of thing a lot, but I don't know if the Braves are where they're at right now today without him because he's been that good. And he's been that reliable. And he's, as I said, he's pitched every game for them for almost every game. Let's look at the Astros. Uh, I, I, lo- I love the the journey that we all go on in life and the not, I ain't giving up, man. Uh, there's uh, there's gotta be something out there that could flip my fortunes. Good job. Um, that's a beautiful story right there. Speaking of, uh, I don't know, not, not really fortunes flipping, but just living a very linear path here, if you will, for the Astros. Five straight league championship series. Now their third World Series in five years. 101, 103, 107 win seasons. Carlos Correa, Jose Altuve, Alex Bregman, Yuli Gurriel. Uh, Altuve's won an MVP. He's won batting titles. Bregman's been a second-place finisher in the MVP. 
Correa is a top of the line leader, might be leaving at the end of the season. But I mean, this is, I think we got to look at the Astros like an all time historic team at this point. It's, I mean, they got to win it, which I think they will. But this has just been an unbelievable run, and the cheating obviously taints a ton of it. But I guess, I, I mean, I feel like we got to give Houston their due. Yeah, we do. And what they've done coming, like, they had so much pressure on themselves coming out of the sign stealing scandal. Like there was, there would be a lot of teams who would fold in their situation. And yet they've gotten to this point again. And obviously they are a a historically great team because they've, they've gone deep in the postseason for what, four out of the last five years now, is it? I mean, they're in the world series for the third time in five years. They've, they've been to the ALCS in five straight seasons. I mean, come on. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. And Yet, I don't know if they're ever going to be considered a historically great team. They have that science-stealing scandal hanging over their heads, um, and it's going to forever taint their look. And they, the thing that's really unfortunate for them is they didn't need to cheat. They are e- extremely good, and we're seeing it this year, just how good they are, even without the science-stealing stuff. It's, I used the word unfortunate before, and it's exactly right. Um, and even if they win this year, if, even if they win it all this year, they're, they're not going to be a historically great team, at least not in my eyes. Think about that comment that you just made, though. They didn't have to cheat. Mm-hmm. How many baseball players come to mind that would have had phenomenal careers and didn't have to cheat? Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens. I'm throwing out names here that I'm sure is going to offend somebody here. But oh, yeah. uh, it, it, you, it's, it's like the list is endless. Rafael Palmero. Sammy, you, yeah, y'all, Sammy yeah. y- y- y'all had, I mean, Barry Bonds is a hall of famer all day long w- with, without steroids. There's no question about it, but people just, they look for the edge. I don't, I, I mean, somebody might, someone might argue well, that's what makes them great. They're always looking of ways to get ahead. And it, it, it's also what gets in their way too. Cause Al, I mean, a rod, come on, man. How good, how good is your career? If you just played it on the straight and narrow, pretty damn freaking good. Mm-hmm. No, you're exactly right. And like, the thing is, is you listed all those players just now, but you got to also wonder how many other players there are that we don't know of that cheated. Like, cause if you ask other teams, or, like, I would think it was, it was somebody with the Oakland A's. I don't want to like give the wrong name, but he recently said that there were a lot more teams who cheated. Um, and the Astros signed stealing years and the Astros were just the scapegoats. You like, you wonder, what exactly or who exactly was cheating. And I like, there was one instance it was in the, or the, the championship series. I talked to Brewers players on the record. It was Zach Davies, Eric Kratz. Um, and there was a couple others and even some other people behind the scenes who weren't willing to be quoted told me that they had significant con- or significant concerns that the Dodgers were cheating back then. Um, and you, they, there was one instance where I had somebody with a team tell me you could see one of the coaches go back and look at video footage um, on one of the camera feeds. The paranoia throughout baseball is so high, and there's teams that have cheated that we don't know of. There's players who have probably cheated that we don't know of. It's, uh, it's tainted the game, but the Astros have, as the player put it, was they were the scapegoats. So who's got the managerial edge? Speaking of, I'm sure they're both going about this the right way right now. Come on, Brian Snitiger and Dusty Baker. Who who do you give the edge to on the top step of the dugout in the World Series? You know, I'm going to give it to Dusty. I like both of them are. Yeah. Oh, I like the look on your face, my friend. Ooh, I, Dusty, I, I, getting, oh, getting, you, getting loved by the insiders. Dusty, shake and bake. Go ahead, tell me why. Wow, shake and baker. Oh boy. Yeah, hey, I'm telling you, I, I like that one. Um, but like what Dusty's done, like, he's just like, he doesn't get enough credit for it. I don't think, I think he's just a really fundamentally sound manager. I mean, obviously he makes moves that I don't agree with. Um, and I'm not saying that the same thing with Snicker. Like I, I like a lot of what he does and the players out in Atlanta love the guy. Like, I was, I was around them for quite a bit to begin the playoffs. And um, like, it just, it's remarkable how universally loved he is, but, um, going back to Dusty Baker, I just think he's a really good manager. He's been in this position before. It's obvi- obviously been a while, but wherever he goes, he can, he's a consistent winner. And um, like I always bet on that kind of guy. 
Dusty coming into the World Series, 12th all-time in regular season wins. The 11 managers ahead of him have all won a World Series. With the exception of Bruce Bochy, they're all in the Hall of Fame. Dusty belongs in the Hall of Fame, whether he wins the World Series or not, but I think he officially really stamps it if uh, if they get her done. That's how, at least I think that's how the baseball voters will look at it. I agree. And I like not to interrupt you, but I have breaking news. Oh, yeah? Not baseball news. It's news oh. that's going to appeal to you from the NFL. Okay. Matt Nagy has tested positive for COVID. <laughs> Oh man, I, I thought we were going into a Matt Nagy has been fired. I would have been, I would have been floored. Matt <laughs> Nagy positive for COVID. Ben in it, ben in it. Yeah, you never should t- should celebrate, but I'm assuming that Matt is vaccinated and he'll be okay. Uh, it's been a rough time in Chicago for the football. Um, so, at any rate, that's uh, that is an interesting breaking news. There, the Bears are doing their. Uh, their Monday morning press conference on zoom. I thought that was because the, um, the ton of the bears reporters got stuck in Tampa because of the rain or whatnot, but maybe it's more to do with Matt. Uh, Matt Nagy will not be going to the pro football hall of fame. So we can segue back into dusty that way. I, I, the, the Braves manager is, is his, his tenure is very interesting. Mm -hmm. He's been with the organization since 1977. You were not on this earth. I was four. Uh, You can do the math on there if you want to put my age together. It's a a little little daunting for me to think about, so I'll just go that far. He he reached triple A for all of two games. He had been managing in the minors since 1982. Mm -hmm. Uh, He became an interim manager in 2016. Um, You know, he had a 72 and 90 season in 2017, and now he's uh, manage the club to four straight and all these titles. And here he is in the world series. Pretty cool story. No, that's a really cool story. And there was, when I was in Milwaukee covering brewers and, and Braves, um, I ended up getting to talk to Brian for a little while with Tom Hodricord of the Milwaukee journal Sentinel. Tom has known him for 40 plus years and, uh, was sharing stories about how Brian was really good friends with Hank Aaron and, and all these Braves legends and how he came up with them. And, uh, like if we're talking about somebody who represents the Atlanta Braves, it's Brian Snicker. Like you will not find a guy who's more of an Atlanta Brave than him. Um, and seeing him in this spot and like come up. So basically with, with him is he was their interim manager when they ended up moving on, I believe it was from Freddie Gonzalez. Um, and there, like, it wasn't expected that he would stick, but the Braves were just so good that they had no choice, but to stick with him. And Alex Anthopoulos, when he came over, um, like he could have cleaned house. He could have ended up bringing in his, his own manager. And yet, as like they kept winning and winning and winning, and Anthopoulos kept them. And like they're going to have no choice to probably extend him in the near future again. Um, they've just been consistent winners with him. And it's a product of what he's done at the helm. Um, and I just give the guy a whole lot of credit because all he does is win. I got the Braves in, I mean, the Braves, I got the Braves losing. I got the Astros in five. Uh, what, what's, 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 what's your prediction here, Bert? Yeah, I'll say Astros in six. I think the Braves win at least two of these games, but um, I feel pretty confident that the Astros are going to end up winning this one. Yeah. All right. Well, congratulations to our first ever guest on uh, the baseball insiders. He was our first guest, right? Robert Ford, play-by-play voice of the Houston Astros, or was he our second guest? Now, oh, so he was our second guest? Who was our first guest? Hell, hell of a question. Who was our – oh, Frank Thomas. The oh, Big yeah. Hurt. The well, Big Hurt. How about a Hall of Famer? We just, we just straight dog the Big Hurt. Leave that in the podcast because uh, I know the Big Hurt's a big listener. So, yeah, Ford was our second guest. All right. Uh, my guy's having a hell of a time down there in, in, in Houston going to the World Series once again. Let's take our first quick time out. And when we come on back, Bert's got breaking. I don't know if it's breaking, but you've got L.A. Dodger news as what we're looking at for the offseason for a Dodgers team that came up short, somewhat surprisingly, in their quest for the back-to-back. Uh, this is the Baseball Insiders coming right back. So the Dodgers get bounced, and now the questions come. Max Scherzer, Corey Seager, top of the list here. 
a very interesting off season that also includes what the hell's going to happen with Trevor Bauer. Uh, let, let's start with those top two here, Bert. What are you, what are you hearing about what the Dodgers are going to do? First off with the Dodgers, you mentioned Trevor Bauer. They, he's under contract next year for a significant amount of money. I want to say it's 48 million bucks, which is an absurd amount of money. And they don't know exactly how much of that contract they have to pay Bauer. He's going to get suspended, I believe. Um, But we don't know how many games and we don't know how much money he's going to lose from that. But I fully expect the Dodgers to, with whatever money they have left to spend, they're going to use it on Max Scherzer. And obviously he's a historically great pitcher. What he's done, like he's a surefire lock for the Hall of Fame. But that being said, there are concerns that he's got dead arm right now. It's not believed to be like a, a ligament issue or anything, but those concerns persist. But that being said, I still fully believe that he's going to end up signing probably the richest contract in baseball history, at least from an annual average value perspective. It's going to be very lucrative and he's deserving of it. There's not many, there isn't, there's not any other pitcher who's des- more deserving than it than Scherzer. Um, and they're going to end up spending that money, and I don't think they're going to have enough money to resign a guy like, say, Corey Seager, or maybe not even Chris Taylor as well. That shortstop market is super interesting. I don't know. Where, I mean, like, where does Seager spin to? What? Where does Correa end up? Javi's out there. I mean, uh, Trevor Story. And to me, that's the most interesting part of the offseason. We can delve deeper into it on, uh, you know, we got plenty of time. But but I, I if, if Corey doesn't end up back with L.A., you want to give an early pick of where he goes? Uh, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know who can afford them. That's like, there's going to be teams that have plenty of money to spend, but the CBA concerns that persist this off season, that's got so many teams wondering what exactly is going to, or how much money they're going to have to spend. And that's not going to be solved until the CBA is like actually done. Is there a plan B if they don't get Max Scherzer, by the way, in your mind, like, okay, fine. They're, they're all in. And I'm assuming he's be happy there. And yeah, all that, but where where else do the Dodgers look if it's not Scherzer? That I think they're going to end up having to look at the trade market if that's going to end up being the case. And like, there's also going to be issues with that because they lost their top two prospects in acquiring Scherzer, um, and their farm system is pretty depleted because of it. And like, obviously, they have some really good pieces in their farm system, um, but you're going to have to look at trade options. I mean, there you could look at free agency, but th- like if you're the Dodgers, I think plan A and plan B and plan C is Scherzer. Um, because if you part with that many players, you cannot lose Max Scherzer. And yes, they got Trey Turner. Um, because I mean, they got Trey Turner under contract for 2022 and that is a huge thing for them. But if like Max Scherzer is the piece that they ultimately wanted in that deal. And Trey Turner was basically just like, it was like the sweetener on top of the thing. So like Scherzer, I think is easily the most likely player of all the Dodgers pending for agents to return. And that's, it's going to be a very lucrative contract. Like I, so I'll actually throw out a team for you. That's going to be in on Scherzer is the Los Angeles angels. They were in on him at the trade deadline. Um, and they are actually were, they were serious about doing it. And I've already started to see reports about the Angels and their players. Um, they're starting to do their recruiting pitch to Scherzer. And it's really interesting to me because Artie Moreno for them is not afraid of spending big bucks. Um, and their biggest need is pitching. And I asked a, a very prominent Angels executive what their offseason plans were. It was his response was pitching, 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 pitching. And he said, if you have a pulse and you can throw, like we're going to be in on you. And there's like, that includes the top targets. Like they are not going to be cash strapped at all. Um, And I I fully expect the angels to be in on shares or in a prominent player. But at the end of the day, I think he does return to the Dodgers. Interesting. Uh, You are anticipating a deflection of uh, one Chris Taylor. And I think you think he's staying in the state. Is that correct? Yeah, I think he's going to be a top target for the San Francisco Giants. I think Taylor is going to have a very strong offseason market because if you look at him, he is very good against left-handed pitching. He's extremely good defensively and can play basically everywhere. Um, like He's the kind of guy who teams are going to look at 
and see a Ben Zobris type, but he's also a lot younger than Zobris was when he was a free agent. Um, and that deal is, at least from the executives that I've talked to, is probably going to exceed $14 million per year, which is a very hefty price tag to pay. But like, And I know some, like some teams are going to be scared off from that, but he's a really valued player throughout the league, and I fully expect the Giants to be firmly in on him, and he could end up being their Chris Bryant replacement, which – I know we've talked about that before, but I'm not as certain about Bryant returning as I once was. Interesting. What's what's happened on the Chris on the KB front? Um, the Giants aren't going to place a huge focus on Bryant in free agency. They're going to let him test the market, and they're going to let him talk to other teams. And like he's not going to be their focus of the offseason, which kind of caught me off guard because he's the kind of guy they ended up pushing all the chips in the middle for during the season for. And they didn't pay like that big of a price tag, but he fit seamlessly in San Francisco and like, he fit into the clubhouse perfectly. Um, so I'm kind of caught off guard by their stance and Farhan Zaidi and Gabe Kapler have both admitted it publicly that they're not going to like make a huge push initially to sign him. Um, which I like, I, I love their transparency, by the way. Like I feel like more executives should do that. Like Brian, I'm not going to rule him out eventually returning to San Francisco. I think both sides are going to be open to it. Um, but I was pretty confident that he'd return to San Francisco, let's say like two or three weeks ago. My optimism on that has faded pretty, pretty big on, or ever since then. My, the, uh, the diehard Cub fans who listen to the baseball insiders, are, they're hoping that you're going to say that he might return to Chicago. Do you see that as a possibility? Because everything I've heard is the answer to that is no. Yeah, I'm got, I got that same indication on my end. I think if there's a team to watch, it might be the New York Mets. Um, they, that, I they've, think always, they've, they've always had interest. Yep, exactly. And I, I feel like even with Francisco Lindor's relationship with Javier Baez, I feel like they would prefer Chris Bryant. Um, and that being said, like, they, like the front office may prefer Bryant, and we don't even know these answers because they don't have a president of baseball operations like running their team at Sandy Alderson right now. But let's say the, the eventual president of baseball operations did prefer Bryant. I wonder if they would end up doing it because by or not bias, but Lindor has Steve Cohen's ear. Um, and Cohen's going to want to please his $341 million star. And there's no better way of doing it that than re-signing his best friend. So that's something to watch out for, I think. You also don't want your franchise to be run by your star player uh, unless it's somebody that's really earned that spot outside of you giving him a huge contract. So yeah. I, I, that, that does not seem like a great plan, but the Mets have not exactly been known to have great plans. Um, you're anticipating a move from uh, another former Cub, I think, from, from Boston back to the NL Central and Kyle Schwarber. Am I hearing that right? Yeah, I, like, I don't know if it – that's a lot to happen. Like I, I actually, it's definitely not a lot to happen. Um, but last off season, the Brewers, they were quietly in on Kyle Schwarber um, and they liked him quite a bit. Just weren't able to work it out. So with them needing another bat this winter, I wonder if they're going to end up being in on Schwarber. Um, they have uh, Avi Garcia, who's likely going to decline his end of the mutual option, becoming a free agent. Jackie Bradley Jr. was, the definition of abysmal last year. He was terrible. Um, and like the only two guys in their outfield that are like, you can depend on are Christian Yelich and Lorenzo Cain and uh, stay tuned there. Um, yeah. And uh, what, what, what does that mean? Bert, are you hearing, are you hearing Yelich trade rumors? Did I hear that right? No, there's no Yelich trade rumors. It, uh, okay. Yeah. I, yeah, so just I'll, I'll leave that hint in there. Stay tuned. Okay. Um, um, and I think Schwarber would end up being a really good fit for them in the corner outfield. They also um, at first base if they need a guy to to take a day. And there's also the option of the potential designated hitter next year. Um, so they, there could be a lot of different spots for Schwarber. They could have the money to sign a guy like him. So like. I'm not saying Schwarber is going to sign with Milwaukee, but I'm just saying like, it makes sense. Interesting. I, that would, uh, that would make a lot of Cub fans jealous if uh, Schwarber is hitting bombs and he would 
he would look, I think he looked great in Miller Park. Uh, speaking of that NL Central, the Cardinals process in hiring their new manager, which you, by the way, said last week was going to happen, is uh, getting a whole bunch of criticism that it was not uh, done properly. I don't, I don't exactly get, get the beef here. Like, what did the Cardinals do wrong? Yeah, like, Marmol was a favorite from the get-go, um, and he was somebody that they value extremely highly in the organization. Um, and Mike Schultz has even lauded him as – as a future managerial candidate. And lo and behold, here he is now the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. But there was a lot of people who thought the Cardinals should have had a more expansive process and end up like talking to more outside candidates. But in reality, they did not really talk to too many people outside the organization or like not even the top candidates, or maybe they talked to the top candidates, but not as many as they should have. Um, and like in those kind of interviews, you can really learn about, one, the people that are that they're talking to, but also to what these organizations are doing really well um, that maybe they're not doing. And that's where you can get better. And the Cardinals from start to finish, when they fired Schilt, uh, settling on Marmol, it was 10 days. Um, that is not a very long process at all. So I think they got the guy that they wanted, um, but it just was not a very thorough process. And, and once again, I'm going to mention friend of the show, Katie Wu, um, she's, she tweeted just a little bit ago, one early observation from this morning that it became increasingly clear throughout this, that it was less of a managerial search and more of a, how well is Marmol going to fit in St. Louis? Um, and she later added sources indicated from the start Marmol was a preferred candidate. Um, so they got their guy. It just was not a very thorough process. If you know who you want to hire, you know who you want to hire. And he's well-respected throughout the game, is he not? Yes. I mean, so he's, you know, this is – Cardinals have always been a little bit of an incestuous uh, organization, right? So mm -hmm. I, I don't and, – and, and in general, that's worked out for him. So um, I don't know. The Mike Schilt thing still feels weird. Uh, you, it's rare that you win 17 games in a row in September and get fired at making the playoffs when really nobody thought you would. But, you know, the, there's some, you know, maybe some guys are looked at, uh, you're an A to B, and maybe they look at Marmol as a B to C, I, I guess. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of how it adds up. So, <laughs> all right. Interesting. Bert, we've got the World Series. We've got our predictions. We've got Chris Bryant on the move. We got Chris Taylor perhaps going up to San Francisco. We got the Brewers staring at Kyle Schwarber. We got Max Scherzer going to the Dodgers. It's a little busy start to the offseason here, my friend, and we're not even there yet. No, this is going to end up being a fun offseason. Let me tell you, my, my phone has started lighting up like a Christmas tree uh, in like the last 10 or so days. So it's going to be a very fun time. And I think we're going to end up having some – very good exclusive info on this podcast and uh, yeah, actually like more of those breaking news alerts, except like not base or not football. It's going to end up actually being baseball stuff. So I, I, I recommend doing one thing going forward. Karma is getting your popcorn ready. Cause it's going to be a good time. Popcorn ready, baby. Follow oh. Robert on Twitter. Don't mess that up at Robert Murray. And um, yeah, you can follow me too at the Carm because I talk to Robert and I and I, I learn things. Uh, yeah, I'm, and, I'm telling you, you guys should follow Carm. He's, he's good people. I, I am good people, damn it. Thank you very much. All <laughs> right, next week we'll delve a little bit into what this offseason is going to look like with the potential lockout, um, general manager meetings uh, in all likelihood not going to be taking place. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll get a little little look at what needs to happen for baseball to start on time in uh, 2022, which is something everybody would love to have. Bert, good to see you, my friend. World Series is here. You, you're you traveling, right? You're on your way? I'm on my way. I head out Thursday uh, Thursday morning to Atlanta, and yeah, it's uh, my first World Series. Let me tell you, I the hype level is at a trillion right now. It's going to be phenomenal. Are you doing both stops, or are you just stopping in Atlanta? Just doing Atlanta on this one. It's gonna be. Out, I'm gonna be out there for four days, and then go visit family who are out there right afterwards. So we're we're gonna make the most of it, and uh, and hopefully bring in some elite content to it at the same time. All right, all right. I'm excited to see you on the road, my friend. Looking forward to all your reporting. I can't wait to uh, get the recap next week on the Baseball Insiders. Thank you for listening. By the way, anybody who rates the podcast, you are heroes. Comments are greatly appreciated. 
And uh, we thank you so much uh, for checking out the Baseball Insiders episode four. I think that's where we're at right now. Is that right? I think so. It's either that or five. Like We're losing track of our podcast here, Carm. This is, we're, we're veteran now. That's not good. That's not good. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have that number correct next week. I think I have it right. But uh, regardless, thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.